Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Every friend group and alliance has a wild card like Turkey who seems to add as many problems as they solve. Recent disagreements have led to questions about whether or not NATO would actually be better off without Turkey altogether. But is that really a good idea? Why does Turkey play such an important role in the NATO alliance, in spite the fact that their president has become increasingly authoritarian and refuses to support sanctions against Russia? Can Turkey really pull off this balancing act of playing the role of impartial mediator of deals between NATO and Russia? In order to understand Turkey's on-again, off-again relationship with NATO, we need to take a look at how we got here. So Turkey has a population of 84 million people. They're a relatively large country, number 17 out of 235. The size of their land is about 760,000 kilometers squared, small compared to the United States. The median age in Turkey is about 31.5 years old, which means that their country is relatively young overall. According to the CIA Factbook, Open Source Intelligence Information, the country Turkey was once a part of the Persian, Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman empires. Their capital was once the center of the world's civilizations. It was like the New York City Times Square of the ancient world. In 1453, Mehmed II, the conqueror, led the Ottoman Turks in seizing the ancient city of Constantinople, where they used some of the world's first artillery and cannons to break down the city walls. They used military tactics that were unbelievably genius by cutting through a forest and making roads where there were none. Once conquered, it has remained Istanbul, and it put an end to a thousand year reign of the Byzantine Empire and by extension, the end of the Roman Empire, really. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire was divided among the Allies. But Turkish people fought this and won their War of Independence in 1923 under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. This is Turkey's founding father and first president. Atatürk implemented reforms to make Turkey a secularized, industrialized, modern nation, meaning they moved away from being just all about religion intertwined with the government. After World War II, the Soviet Union became more aggressive aggressive and look to expand its power. The Soviets tore up the Treaty of Friendship and Non-Aggression that they'd signed with Turkey in 1925, and they refused to reinstate it unless Turkey allowed them to build military bases on the Straits of the Danderlis. NATO was formed in 1949, largely as a unified response to the Soviet aggression and expansionism, and Turkey wanted in. They made a bid for NATO membership in 1950. Turkey is in a unique geographic and geopolitical position because they're located at the crossroads between Europe and Asia and the Middle East, and it contains the Straits of Dardanelles, the only passageway between the Mediterranean and the Black Seas. 50,000 ships pass through the Turkish Straits annually, which is three times higher than the Suez Canal. The Turkish Straits accounts for approximately approximately 2.5 million barrels of oil headed to Europe per day. This is one of only eight locations in the world where 66% of the world's oil passes through. It's considered an oil choke point that is crucial for Europe's energy security. This strait carries cargo from vessels that consist of energy, oil, natural gas, from Russian ports and markets, from Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland. They all go through this strait. So it kind of makes sense that Turkey today is trying to be a bridge between the East and the West because geographically, that's what they've always been. Turkey is very literally a transcontinental country being located in both Asia and Europe. 97% of Turkey's land is in Asia and only 3% is in Europe, but you can really see the European influence everywhere in their culture and even the architecture of their buildings. For all the headaches that Turkey occasionally makes within NATO, they're a major contributor to international security and peace. They're a key partner in the Mediterranean because they border Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran, Iraq, Syria. Democracy in the country has been an on again, off again though. So they've always been flirting, but never fully committing to democracy. They're there have been periods of instability with military coups in 1960, 1971, 1980. On July 15th, 2016, a major event happened in Turkey that has damaged their relationship with NATO ever since. We are covering an attempted coup right now in Turkey. We have reports of gunfire, helicopters, and jets flying over Ankara and Istanbul. What we do know is that uh, the military has blocked streets and bridges across the Bosphorus, but also has not been able to capture the President Erdogan. This coup is Turkey's last chance to avoid becoming 
an authoritarian Islamic regime. A faction within the Turkish armed forces, calling themselves the Peace at Home Council, attempted an armed coup against Erdogan and the state of Turkey. Tanks rolled down the streets in Istanbul and troops captured the headquarters of the party. Fighter jets even bombed the parliament building in Ankara. The group captured the TRT news channel, which is Turkey's taxpayer funded news, and they forced the anchor to broadcast a statement allegedly at gunpoint. The group claimed that the coup was about regaining their fundamental human rights and freedoms that had been destroyed by President Erdogan. They claimed their country was becoming an autocracy based on fear. But the majority of the Turkish armed forces were still loyal to President Erdogan, and they successfully prevented the government from being overthrown. In the fallout of the failed coup, we can see why Turkey and NATO have drifted apart ever since. President Erdogan blamed the coup on an exiled businessman, Fatan Galen, who lives in the United States. He claimed that Galen is a terrorist and the U.S. is harboring him. Erdogan claimed the CIA was behind a plot to assassinate him. A state-run newspaper in Turkey outright said the coup was orchestrated by the CIA, and a poll on Twitter found 69% of Turkish people believe the White House did it. The Turkish interior minister even accused the U.S. of the 2016 failed coup. The White House has denied any involvement and believes the claims against Mr. Galen likely would not hold up in extradition court. But to be fair, after the CIA's own self-admitted history of overthrowing foreign governments, like Iran in the 1950s, you can't really blame Turkey for being suspicious. In order to clamp down and consolidate his power, Erdogan had 70,000 people arrested and over 125,000 more were dismissed from the Turkish military, media, government, and academic positions. Critics claim this has had the effect of bringing the nation closer to authoritarianism. All of this creates tension within the alliance because in order to join NATO in the first place, you're supposed to be a democracy. A poll from January 2022 found that 39% of people in Turkey wanted a closer relationship with Russia and China. China instead of NATO. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we saw Erdogan double its imports of Russian oil, and he decided not to ban doing business with Russian companies, like many EU and American companies did. To make matters worse, on Friday, September 16th, Turkey became the first NATO member state with ambitions to join the China-led Shanghai Cooperation Organization. To way oversimplify it here for my average infantryman brain, the CSTO is like China's version of NATO. Its members include Russia and Pakistan. The way NATO works is it's based on reaching a consensus and mutual agreement. All the member states need to be on the same exact page. And oftentimes, Turkey's the black sheep odd man out who disagrees with NATO decisions. For instance, Turkey purchased the S-400 missile system from Russia, an advanced missile system which is designed to destroy NATO aircraft specifically. The United States explicitly asked Turkey to pretty please do not do that because it would compromise their F-35 fighter jet stealth technology. Turkey being the wild card that they are, shook their head and did it anyway, spending an estimated $2.5 billion for the Russian technology, the mobile surface to air missile, because sometimes you gotta just stir the pot and shake things up a little bit in the alliance. In Turkey's defense, they claimed that the S-400 systems would never be integrated into NATO, so they would pose no threat to the F-35 security. Turkey says that they were forced into purchasing this Russian anti-air systems because no NATO ally would sell them similar equipment on reasonable terms. This led to the United States slapping Turkey with a series of economic sanctions for this, and it cut Turkey out of giving them the F-35 jet, which they were supposed to get. Ivo H. Dadlar, a former U.S. ambassador to NATO, said, quote, in my four years there, it was quite often 27 against one. So basically, Turkey's frequently at odds with their military alliance that they're a part of. Turkey seems to solve as many problems as they cause within NATO, as they're always there to fix things that no one else could ever possibly fix, like helping broker a deal between Russia and Ukraine in order to allow for the shipment of over 50,000 tons of Ukrainian grain. The thing is, when it comes down to it, you need that wild card in your friend group, even if you end up being the one that always has to pay for their Uber back home every single time, just because you know that they're insanely valuable on the geopolitical world stage. One of the biggest geopolitical strengths that Turkey has, and a huge playing card for them, came about when Turkey was barely 10 years old. There were fascist governments popping up, rising around Europe in the 1930s at the time, and the question of who would control the Strait of Dandernelles and how they would be regulated became a pressing question. This is a 62 kilometer water channel. Turkey led the effort and called a meeting of the concerned countries in the Montreux, Switzerland. The countries eventually reached an agreement known as the Montreux Convention. 
This agreement basically gives Turkey the ultimate control of this insanely valuable passageway. Merchant ships can move freely along the passage during peacetime. There are restrictions on the warships that countries can send into the Black Sea, and more lenient restrictions on the countries who border the Black Sea. Turkey controls which militaries can travel through the Straits, including the United States. Russia agreed to the terms because it protected their Black Sea borders from outside countries. Great Britain signed on because it eliminated Russia's power in the Mediterranean because Great Britain figured correctly that Turkey might be a useful ally in case of a war with Italy and Germany. Turkey stayed neutral for most of World War II, but the Montreux Convention allowed them to keep Axis ships out of the Black Sea, which was beneficial for the Allies and the Soviets. Following the rights provided by the Montreux Convention, Turkey was given the right to charge a fee for ships passing through the Straits. When Ukraine was granted the right to pass grain, they hiked up their prices. Turkey changed from charging 80 cents to $4 per ton, which will raise $200 million in revenue for Turkey. NATO built a strategically important Irkutsk Air Base in Turkey in 1955, which is home to over 50 nuclear weapons. The Kanya Air Base, which hosts NATO's AWACS surveillance jets, was built in 1983. NATO Land Forces headquarters are located in Buka, near Izmir, on the Argan Sea. In other words, Turkey is valuable in NATO. They are deeply established, and they've remained that way through Turkey's multiple military coups, and in more recent, they've been a term away from secular government that their founding father envisioned towards a more Islamic state under President Erdogan. Many say he's turned into a dictator. Erdogan is the real wild card here. He's been running the show in Turkey since 2003, first as prime minister, now as president, and his human rights uh, record is less than stellar. There have been massacres, huge displacement of Kurdish people, and an ongoing effort to deny the existence of the Kurdish people and their language as a whole. It was illegal to speak Kurdish in public until 1991, and it's still illegal to use Kurdish as an instruction language in Turkey. Turkish schools. Erdogan claims his problems are with the Kurdish terrorist groups, and some groups like the PKK have committed acts of terrorism. But Erdogan has used the label of terrorism to condemn and attack people he simply disagrees with or doesn't like. And when Turkish backed forces attack or displace Kurdish terrorists, they don't differentiate much between terrorists and civilians. Turkey denied the United States the ability to launch a northern front in their invasion of Iraq in 2003. The US wanted to deploy 62,000 troops in the north to invade from there as well as from Kuwait in the south, but 264 votes in favor and 250 votes against meant that Turkey denied the move and rejected a $15 billion aid package that the United States was waving in front of them offering them in return, which shocked everyone at the time. They left 80 American warships that were carrying the 4th U.S. Infantry Division floating off their coast because they thought Turkey would say yes. But that's just Turkey doing what Turkey does. They're the wild card, unpredictable. Erdogan's response to the anti-government Gez Park protests of 2013 demonstrated his attitude that the stent in Turkey is not okay. Riot police violently evicted protesters from Gezi Park, and just this year, Osman Kavalali was sentenced to life in prison for his role in organizing the peaceful protest, with seven other activists receiving 18-year prison sentences. Human Rights Watch estimated in 2020 that Turkey had imprisoned or detained 87 journalists for their terrorism charges related to their journalist work. The government has also arrested people for their posts on social media. They control most of the major media outlets in the country. Erdogan security team violently attacked American protesters on American soil in Washington, D.C. in 2019, and they never faced any consequences for these illegal actions. It's no wonder that some people, like former Senator Joe Lieberman, had suggested that Turkey wouldn't meet NATO's standards for democratic governance if they were to apply for membership today. Do we ever just revoke that Costco card? Since Russia invaded Ukraine, Turkey's been playing both sides real hard. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is the center of this conflict. NATO is the largest alliance on the planet, and some believe that Russia attacked Ukraine because of their desire to join NATO. So how can NATO strengthen their position? Well, one way would be to add more countries to the alliance. Finland and Sweden abstained from joining NATO for 70 years. Finland, who shares a 800-mile-long border with Russia, didn't want anyone to provoke them. In May 2022, both Finland and Sweden applied to join NATO. Expanding NATO requires the consensus of all other member countries. But this one's a no-brainer, right? They bring so much to the table. Sweden's got the Muppet chef and the fish, and Finland's got the prime minister who likes to party. Who would object to adding them to NATO at such a crucial time? Sounds like we need a wild card here. Where's Turkey? 
Erdogan objected to adding Sweden and Finland to NATO because of the embargoes that the countries issued against Turkey after the 2019 incursion into Syria, as well as both countries' perceived support for Kurdish militia groups and individuals that Turkey classifies as terrorists. Turkey eventually relented after some undisclosed compromise was reached. But the willingness to hold up the entire process at such a crucial juncture is just one example of Turkey's selfish diplomacy, or at least their president. And while many other world leaders view Turkey as an unreliable ally, that might not always be the case. It isn't all bad, which is why Turkey is a true wild card. Turkey was the only one that was able to be the host of peace talks between Ukraine and Russia early on in the war, and will likely be the host of any future negotiations. The Turkish arms company, allowed by Erdogan's son-in-law, Salak Bayraktar, sold state-of-the-art drones to Ukraine's army that have been very effective in destroying Russian air defense systems and armored vehicles. Let's list off all the times Turkey has thrown a wrench into NATO plans. In 2000. Turkey vetoed the appointment of Anders Fuhr Rosamin to NATO chief because of Rosamin's lax response to the cartoons depicting Muhammad in Danish newspapers. In 2010, after relations between Turkey and Israel went south, Erdogan prevented NATO from working with Israel for six years. And a few years later, Erdogan delayed a NATO plan to fortify Eastern European countries against Russia because of issues with the Kurdish militants. And in 2019, throughout the Syrian civil war, Turkey's backed fighters that have attacked US-backed Kurdish groups in northeastern Syria. Yachts belonging to Russian oligarchs have been seen on Turkish shores since the start of the war, and it's believed that Turkish banks are helping Russian companies avoid sanctions imposed by other countries. The two countries are tied through energy as well. Russia built Turkey's first nuclear power plant, as well as a gas pipeline to Turkey under the Black Sea. Erdogan and Putin have met multiple times since the start of the war in Ukraine. However, there is one major reason that might explain why Turkey's going against NATO. Turkey's economy is in the toilet at the moment, and that's largely because of Erdogan's own economic policies. Erdogan pressured Turkey's central bank to cut interest rates multiple times in 2021 and 2022, which caused the Turkish lira to lose half its value as inflation soared. Normally in a democracy, a president doesn't have this power, but in Turkey, Erdogan can simply fire anyone who refuses to cut interest rates. The Syrian refugee crisis has further complicated matters, especially with the economy tanking. There are more than 3 million Syrian refugees in Turkey right now, and Russia could send more refugees across Turkey's border with renewed attacks on Syria. In 2023, an election year for Erdogan, his economy and his popularity are at an all-time low. This explains why he might be more open to doing business with Russian oligarchs and welcome Russian money into his banks and help Putin get around sanctions that could bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Is Turkey's military a powerful asset for NATO? Turkish military is the second largest standing military in NATO. They have about 775,000 to 800,000 military personnel, but the gross size doesn't really tell us anything about their actual combat power. World Bank data puts their defense spending in 2020 at about $17.7 billion, a 13% decline from 2019. One of the criteria for being a part of NATO is making sure that there's oversight of your military and defense budget. There have been some questions raised about the transparency of Turkey's spending with their government agencies unable to audit the money spent on their forces. Audit reports that 150 institutions sent Turkey parliament in 2013 did not include detailed balance sheets and it lacked the comprehensive data that was necessary for oversight of their military. Global Firepower ranks them at number 13 of world military. So let's see why that is. When we look at that force structure of 700,000, that number is really more accurate to say that it's about 335,000 active soldiers, and 260,000 of those are in the army with 45,000 in the naval forces. Then you have 50,000 personnel in the air force. The rest of the troop strength comes from the 378,000 reserve personnel and about 150,000 paramilitary forces. Since 1998, Turkey's been working on a military modernization program where they're spending about $160 billion to upgrade, buy new tanks, fighter jets, and assault rifles. They are the NATO ally that is most likely to engage in major combat operations due to the Syrian war happening right on their border. These reserve forces 
are fundamental to Turkey and their defense strategy. The Grand Emir is responsible for public order in places that fall outside jurisdiction of their police forces, which might be an odd notion to most Western people, but in Turkey, this means some of their rural provinces have their internal security carried out by this group. Erdogan isn't exactly a champion of human rights or democratic institutions, and worse yet, he's desperate. The war in Ukraine has put Erdogan in a position where he's valuable to both NATO and Russia, and he's more than willing to play both sides to save his ass in the short term. The question is, how long can that last? And how long will NATO and Russia put up with it? As former US ambassador to NATO, Ivo Dadlar put it, Erdogan has, quote, figured out a way to play his game, but he's doing it at the expense of an alliance which is key to his own security. So yes, Turkey is the wild card of NATO, but Erdogan's short-sighted diplomacy could spell trouble in Turkey's future. Thank you so much for watching. If you found the information in this video valuable in some way or compelling, please remember to hit the like and subscribe button. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. If you like this video, I think you guys will really enjoy this one. It's a deep dive on China and Russia's hypersonic missiles program and whether or not NATO should be worried about it.